I'm Matt Dixon, and welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. The mission of Purple Patch is to empower and educate every human being to reach their athletic potential. Through the lens of athletic potential, you reach your human potential. The purpose of this podcast is to help time-starved people everywhere integrate sport into life. In today's show, we're talking about going faster. No matter what your fitness level or training preparation, how to get more out of that fitness for speed returns. The extra source, as I like to call it. But let's talk about the physical for a moment first. Make no mistake that we want you to be as fit and prepared as possible. We want you to be physiologically firing on all cylinders. And that's where Inside Tracker comes in. A great tool to help us get to that point. Take a look inside, assess in your biometrics and receive a personal action plan for where to focus and where you should place your effort to develop a great platform of health and of course, performance readiness. It's very, very simple. You don't need to be a Purple Patch coached athlete to take advantage. Just head to insidetracker.com slash purple patch and there's a sneaky code, Purple Patch Pro 20. That's Purple Patch Pro 20. You get 20% off everything at the store. Hugely beneficial and powerful tool to help you in your journey of, well, race results, but also longevity and health and daily performance. All right, enjoy the show. You choose your race, you train, you prepare, you do everything you can to build your fitness to be ready. But goodness me, it's a hard, it's a tough, and it's a hilly course. That's not a reason to be afraid. On May 17th, 9 a.m. Pacific, I'm hosting a webinar to help you unlock your best speed no matter what your physical preparation is. And it turns out that there's real science and a little bit of art to actually help you on that journey. We're gonna go through all of the concepts to to help you understand how to distribute your effort over really challenging courses to unlock your best speed returns. We'll go through swim, bike, and run. But beyond the concepts, I wanna make sure that you can apply those concepts. So under every element, you're gonna leave with some practical advice and steps that will translate to faster speed. This was our most popular webinar that we did last year, and this year we've got brand new information that are gonna help you get even faster. Yes, this is version 2.0. I hope that you can attend live, but even if you can't, register and we'll make sure that we send you the information so that you can go faster without any more fitness. I promise I am going to introduce the show and welcome you all in one quick moment, but I do want to add one very important note. If you're interested in becoming a part of the Purple Patch team, we have a very rare spot opening up on our coaching roster. Now to be a Purple Patch coach, it's not a hobby, it's a career. It is about becoming a part of a team where you are vested in helping people achieve the results that they want, both in sport, but also broader life. The ideal candidate, well, you're probably really immersed in the Purple Patch methodology. My guess is that you're an avid listener to this show. You're a little bit seasoned. You've got some great experience within the sport of triathlon and beyond, and certainly understanding how to coach people with some proven results. But more than anything, you've got great ambition. You got all of the traits that we look for, collaboration, communication, a passion for helping people evolve and improve. If you're interested, the job is on the website, purplepatchfitness.com, head to the careers page, or you can reach out to us, info at purplepatchfitness.com. This occurs every few years at most. We take a very long time to actually integrate anyone into the team to ensure that you are ready to actually be a part of the Purple Patch coaching team. And it's a wonderful opportunity for the person that seriously wants to get involved and be a part of a cracking team. I love our team. Alrighty, let's uh, get on with the show. But if you're interested or if you know anyone that would, this is the best place that I'm going to be able to source the right next candidate. Thanks for listening and enjoy the show today. And welcome to the Purple Patch Podcast. As ever, your host, Matt Dixon. And today, we're going to go fast, guys. Today is one for the triathletes and the endurance athletes. Free speed is the title of this. You've heard it all before. Is there really a thing? such as free speed? Well, it turns out, yeah, there 
kind of is, although it's very well earned, let me tell you that. Today is all about how you should think out of the box and maximize your performance without getting even one little bit fitter than you are now. So in that sense, it's kind of free. Perhaps we label it as smart speed rather than free speed. I'm gonna break it down into sections so that I can hopefully help you get faster. Now this is part one today, and we're gonna focus on swim, bike, run, the three disciplines of triathlon. In part two, that's coming up very soon, we're gonna discuss elements such as race craft, energy management, your mindset, all absolutely important components to you going faster. But let's just keep it to the three core disciplines to get going. Now, before we get going, a little bit of a note. You're going to notice a few things that are a little bit different today. This is a brand new episode, and if you're a regular listener, you're going to see that we've shifted things around a little bit. You see, we've decided to restructure the show to ensure that we can get more relevant education to you quicker. It's focused even more around education so that we can really maximize the value for you. In other words, we're gonna give you more of what you want. And so we're not gonna integrate and have a big section on Matt's newsing. So we're gonna go pretty much straight to the meat and potatoes apart from a new section first, which is about what's going on. And so what are the elements that we see in either news, performance literature, research, or maybe what we're doing at Purple Patch to help our athletes so that you can utilize that in your own journey. And so that's a front part of education. Then we'll dive into the meat and potatoes. What you will notice today is that we do have a couple of little intersections of 30 seconds. Let's call it at, just talking about Purple Patch, little breaks in the education. And that's so that we can keep this show free for you, highly accessible, so that we can have it. So we don't take on a massive amount of endorsements. We say no to a lot of people so that we can make this very education heavy. But of course, there is the most important thing that I need to do as a business owner is at least tell you about our offering. So give me 30 seconds of your time, a couple of moments through the meat and potatoes, and we can keep this as close to ad free as we possibly can. All right, with that, I haven't got a name for this section yet, but what I'm going to call it, and maybe this will stick, is Coach's Corner. Let's do Coach's Corner. Yep, Coach's Corner, a free, all-encompassing component of what's going on this week, what I'm seeing as a coach. And what I thought we would do to kick this off is take a little bit of a peek behind the curtain around what's going on with the training progression at Purple Patch. What are we doing with our athletes right now as we are really merging into Q2, second quarter now. We're about a month into this right now. But how has our work shifted? Well, we've got a lot of things going on at the moment because we've gone through a couple of phases of preparation. We've done a lot of power and speed work. And now suddenly we're starting to see this divergence of focus for athletes. Early season races, the sun coming out, at least in the Northern Hemisphere, temperatures warming up, people getting outside more. And ultimately people's focus really ramping up. In other words, it's getting serious right now. So we have a whole bunch of stuff starting. And in general, The overall, if we throw a blanket over it, the overall focus is we are looking to chase speed right now. So in other words, it's time to actually convert our athletes to serious fitness and speed. And so what that means from a training component is recently we did a whole bunch of work on preparation, getting the body ready to really be able to absorb and adapt some very hard training. We also did some very, very short high intensity work and we did a ton of it. That was to build our physiological capacity and our ability to actually recruit maximal fibers to generate best power, whether you're talking about running, whether you're talking about riding. And so that was a real focus, but we weren't really focusing on resilience, developing general core endurance, actually being able to have a maximal steady state at a higher operational level. That's all coming. Those are the central fitness drivers. And a lot of that work is occurring just under, at, and above what we call our threshold, our maximal steady state. And that's really timely because we're syncing this effort 
with the improving weather. And so therefore, we start to have a greater emphasis on going outside, building some longer hours within context of life, and actually getting some additional outside riding and components. And so with that, while we're building central physiology, we're also starting to get very race specific around skills starting to integrate some components that athletes are going to utilize in their racing. You're going to hear about it in terrain management today on the bicycle and on the run a little bit. We're going to think about sighting in swimming, some of the elements to actually start to develop and improve athletes' race craft. So that's what the focus is, whether you're being coached individually by a Purple Patch coach or as a part of our tri-squad program. So that's our emphasis right now. I'd love to hear what your emphasis is. Have you spent the miles just old school building base? Or are you in sync with how we're doing it at Purple Patch? The key is that these coming months, we actually dial it up a little bit. And so what becomes really important for us is all of the supporting elements. I'm gonna talk about that next week a little bit, but some of those elements to really help athletes manage the training program within the context of life and in making sure that it's not dissolving your ability to show up in the other components of life. So we have a lot of emphasis around education of that. More coming on that next week. Second thing in Coach's Corner, it is Mental Health Month this week. And to celebrate this a little bit, although it seems funny for me to say celebrate Mental Health Month, but um, to dive a little bit deeper maybe, I really encourage you to go back to last week's show. If you gave it a listen, give it another listen. That was the interview that we did with Ben Cooper. I felt it was an incredible story around the importance of fitness and the power of sport to help Ben and anyone struggling with navigating any sort of mental health challenges to emerge in life. It's a great ingredient that Ben leveraged to overcome his mental health challenges and ultimately, in my perspective as his coach, evolved to a high performance human being. So if you missed it, absolutely go back. I really see that as one of the shows of the year for me so far, and I think it's absolutely unmissable. And I'd love to hear what you think about it. Ben's story is also an endorsement of a wealth of research out there that's linking improved mental health and also the reversal of symptoms of depression as a byproduct from adopting and committing to regular exercise and, and uh, health practices. And that includes strength training as much as it does cardiovascular conditioning. Now, this isn't medical advice. If you're struggling with mental health, I absolutely encourage you to follow the guidelines of your primary care doctor or whoever is overseeing your care. But with this, we do know that exercise is healthy. And research displays that there is a positive impact in improving people's mental health. And so I encourage you to really aim to adopt that daily practice, if nothing else than for a supportive and additive aspect to your journey in improving your health. I believe that movement, strength, and other habits should be absolutely integral to almost every person who is facing mental health challenges. It is medicine for a better life. And with that, that'll do for Coach's Corner this week. We are going to transition, Barry, to speed. And this week, we're going to talk about triathlon specifically. How do you get faster? Barry, it is the meat and potatoes. Yes, folks, the meat and potatoes. Let's kick off with a nice story about a man called Gary. Gary is committed. He trains hard. He hits every single session. He uploads his heart rate, his power, his GPS. He tracks his sleep, his readiness score, and he loves to analyze his progression. Showing and navigating through his total training load, his fitness calculations, his monthly miles, his hours of training that he does. And let me tell you, he is fit. And yet his race results never really mirror the fitness curve data. He feels like he's turned over every single stone. Well, Gary, let me hold your hand and guide you into a new field of stones that you can begin to turn over. And these stones that you turn over will reveal just how much faster, without improving any of those fitness metrics or spending any more dollar, that you can get. And I mean much faster. What a find, folks. What a wonderful field for Gary to navigate into. No more fitness and yet more speed to gain? Goodness me. 
With these epiphanies, Gary can now go podium hunting, and you can too. And I wanna dig in and reveal my thoughts. In part one, I'm gonna go through three disciplines of triathlon, swim, bike, and run. And we're gonna break this into three distinct sections and build out the show. In part two, we're really gonna dig into some more race craft, mindset, energy management, and components like that. For today's show, swim, bike, and run. How can you leverage the elements that we're gonna talk about today to go faster without being fitter? Part one, the swim. Make no mistake, swim performance is anchored in two core components. Number one, technique. Number two, swim fitness and resilience. There is no shortcut to performance. But what else can you do to go faster, especially as a triathlete? There are three actionable tactics that we can break down. The first, when we're thinking about racing in open water, is swimming in a straight line. Now this is simple race craft, but truly committing to building open water swim skills, of sighting mechanics, applied sighting skills, where you're actually using those mechanics to sight and angle in the right direction, and then developing open water awareness, it's central. And so how do we do this? How can we get as fit as you possibly can in a swimming pool and transfer it where there can be a, the smallest delta possible to your actual open water swim speed? Well, the first element is learning some of the core mechanics when you're swimming in a pool. It's fundamental that you need to learn how to sight correctly without the disruption of your core swimming mechanics. This sounds simple, but the vast majority of people don't do it. They swim up and down a pool in a controlled environment, and suddenly they find themselves on race day, and they don't understand how to sight while holding the rhythm. Now in the show notes today, I'm gonna to link to a really helpful video to show you some of the mechanics that I like to leverage for improved sighting and swimming mechanics. But you can take that video, you can take the concepts, and it won't happen all to magically. You need to invest and you need to integrate it into your training. The best place to actually practice this, in a swimming pool. Over the course of warm up, building into some pre-main sets, actually integrating into your working very, very hard in main meat potatoes of workouts, do it with sighting. You are an open water swimming. It's not just about how fast you can go in the pool, it's about how fast you can go in a pool with proper mechanics that will apply to open water where you're actually racing. And then, if possible, applying them in an open water environment so that you can build familiarity, you can actually integrate them into variable conditions, and you can improve. And over the course of time, using the landscape around, using even the sun as it's moving in the sky, developing an awareness around you, you actually become better at swimming in a straight line. And that is so much faster relative to your state of fitness. Take any GPS of any age group swimmer and it's gonna look like they oscillate between swimming to Egypt and swimming back to New York. Instead of that, swim in a straight line, like the crow flies. That's the way to get there, but it doesn't happen by accident. The second element of swimming components, where you can actually yield better speed return for your fitness, is to truly understand and start to develop some of the core technical swim stroke elements for open water. Let's take a step back. Pool swimming is in a highly structured, controlled environment. Outside of some splashing across the lane from other swimmers, you have a lovely surface that has a little wall on either side called a lane line. You've got a fixed length pool, and often you've got lights or a roof overhead to help you get swimming in a straight line in a nice environment. Now, many of you probably take swim lessons, or maybe you go onto YouTube and you search for proper swim stroke, particularly if you're an adult onset swimmer and you follow the guidelines, and you practice the drills, 
and you start to improve your technical swim stroke. But the truth is that the vast majority of those YouTube videos or swim instructions that you get from your private lessons that you invest in is helping you develop technique that is geared towards the tranquil environment of a swimming pool. And the demands of a regular swim meet that are lasting oh, 20 seconds up to five minutes or so, unless we add in the 1500 to the mix. Now let's compare that to what you're actually doing in a triathlon. You're swimming for longer durations, 400 meters, 800 meters, 1500 meters, all the way up to almost 4,000 meters of swimming in an environment that is dirty, dynamic, chaotic, and absolutely variable. And you're doing it with hundreds of your friends. And so developing the right stroke for you is not about trying to mimic as close as you can to what Michael Phelps does. It's just not applicable to you. That's the equivalent of taking a sprinter, a 100-meter sprinter. Oh, I don't know. Who's that geezer from Jamaica? Oh, can you remember his name? He's pretty fast at the 100 and 200. Yeah, it's like trying to run like him. But that doesn't apply to you. It's not appropriate. Instead, you want to take action to develop the right stroke for you and then start to apply it in open water. Now, improving your technique, yes, that's fantastic. But ensure that you improve it for you around your open water. So what's the best route for you to do this? That sounds great conceptually, but how do you get there? Well, the best path, let's be clear here, the very best path is that you can source a local coach next to you who is wholly equipped and truly understands the demands of open water. And they are out there. They are dotted around the country and world that really understand you as a triathlete and the dynamic nature and are not going to try and pigeonhole you down into developing technique that might be good for a swimming pool but absolutely isn't good for the challenge that you're facing. And so if you can source that, it's a wonderful investment to go. A second option is to leverage a coach remotely via video. So we have John Stevens, fantastic. John was a division one collegiate swimmer, so he knows a lot about pool swimming, but he's also a huge, I would say, global resource in open water. And he also happens to be a great technician. He's a really good coach at helping people deliver and improve technique, much, much better than I am. I have to be clear on this. And so at the Purple Patch Swim Program, we have really huge results with people improving by getting personalized feedback via video assessment, some specific drills that are going to be useful for them, as well as specific workouts that they should integrate into their training to help develop those aspects so that then they're going to be able to go and leverage it in open water for better speed returns. And that end-to-end -end cycle is really important. Now, of course, at the bookend of that assessment and program is another consultation with John to ensure that the actual changes are sticking. Otherwise, it evaporates. It's very, very difficult. And so you can, I'll give you details in the show notes of that program. And I'm not telling you this to be salesy in any way, but this is a real challenge for adult onset swimmers. I need to get better at swimming technically and then you invest your time and your money and your effort into improving your technique. And it's really unfortunate, but you're just on the wrong track. You might be improving technically, but not actually for the specific demands. And so to get free speed, you wanna have a shifted track. And if you can find a local resource, tremendous. Someone in person that really understands open water. But that's pretty difficult. And so another option might be to lean into someone like a John Stevens that has an end-to-end -end program that can really help you get there via video. So that's the premise on that. Absolutely key. So we've got two elements in swimming so far. We have number one, the swimming in a straight line. Number two, starting to develop your open water specific swim stroke. Number three, something that we can all do, a race specific trick for you. And that is to count your strokes. When you're swimming in open water, it can feel like you're just on one long treadmill. 
And it's understandable that many amateurs just allow their mind to stray. And so let's break the mold on this, because as soon as you lose focus and you start to get, for lack of a better phrase, bored in your open water swim, you start to just apply a little less tension. You start to actually drop the effort. And even though your fitness and muscular endurance is there, you just move into this blah mode. When's this going to be over? Let's put the swim behind my ears so I can get on with the bike. And that's really common because you don't have walls to push off. You're not breaking it up. So instead, you need a tool that's going to keep you present, focused, engaged, and really driving water that you're holding backwards to create propulsion. The best tool for that, I find, is stroke counting. It keeps you systemically involved, focused, and ensuring that you're taking action to do the best you can with your trained endurance. So how do you do that? Well, the truth is that you want to prevent decline. And so you move into a rhythm of stroke counts. And the pattern, there is no rule. What works for you is the thing that works. And so just by way of an example, you might do 50 swim, swim strokes. Right, left, right, left, one, two, three, four. So every time one arm moves backwards, whether it's right or left, it's a stroke count. And maybe you do 50 stroke counts where you're on. And in that 50, you're wholly present. You're driving water behind you, and it's a little interval. And then you might go 10 or 15 strokes where you use it to try and reset the connection. You just go smooth, you lower the breathing, you lower the heart rate, maybe just lengthen the stroke a little bit, and then you go back on 50 strokes. Driving water back every stroke, right, left, right, left. It's an opportunity then in the little gap, 10 or 15 strokes between, to reset your timing and connection so that then when you start to apply pressure again and you start with the new 50 count, you're applying the best propulsion with the most streamlined vessel possible. Now, it might end up being 100 strokes on, 20 off. It might be 200 strokes, 50 off. There's no real rhythm that is the magic ingredient. It's the thing that you can do that is easiest for you to integrate. And I promise you, it's the best path for speed return that you can get relative to whatever fitness you have. Combine all these three, and you're gonna get more from your fitness. You're gonna go faster in your swim. Today, we're talking about going faster. And in order to go fast, you still need every session that you train to count. TriSquad is the only program that is specifically designed from the ground up for time-staffed athletes like you. I've been coaching this for 20 years. I wrote a book specifically on the topic. And since that time, we've continued to evolve and grow our programming. Every single one of our 1,500 World Championship qualifiers are time-staffed. Most of them are very, very busy with professional life as well as families and everything else. And yet, we maximize the output from every single session. They all count. You have three steps to get on the program and join us. First, head to purplepatchfitness.com squad. Take a look at the program. You can be on program within minutes. Literally register, get on program, and then we will set up a personal call to get you navigated and ensure that you have a wonderful experience. And we are so confident that you're gonna love the program. Of course, as ever, the third step, if you don't love it, you're going to get your money back. Within the first 30 days, it's a full 30-day money-back guarantee. If you have any questions or if you want to reach out for a free complimentary consultation, info at purplepatchfitness.com. Let's get back on with the show. Part two, the bike. I think this is the highest opportunity to gain speed. And so what are the elements that you can do, no matter how fit you get on the bike, no matter how nice your bike is and how much money you spent on it, how do you get the most speed? Well, the first element is the big one. We can't bypass this, terrain management. If you aim to stick to one power throughout your race in a very narrow range, you are leaving speed on the table. And if you stick to one cadence range, so just one leg speed all the way through, you are leaving speed on the table. If you wanna get the biggest yield of speed relative 
to your trained potential, your heart rate, your power, and your cadence should vary. Here are the steps to help you with this. Now, this is an in-person or video-based coaching. I can't do it all on this show, but I can give you some actionable steps. Number one, and this is the important one, where are your eyes? Where are you placing your focus? If you wanna get best speed return, your eyes should not be constantly on your metrics and meters. You wanna have your eyes up the road. So you wanna be looking at the terrain and so that you can plan, you can feel the grade changes and you can respond. And as you're coming up on hills, as the grade goes up, as gravity is working against you, your effort and your power should creep up a little bit, that's normal. And as you're cresting, as the grade starts to dissipate, that hill or little grade that was going up starts to get flatter towards downhill, you should always be building speed. Now this isn't a bang, this is a smooth build of speed. And you use increasing leg speed, increasing effort for a bit, just four, five, six, seven seconds worth, and adding gears as the grade dissipates. It's a simple rule. Whenever you're going uphill, as it crests and the grade dissipates, you need to go faster. So we've done two so far. Number one, as the grade builds up and gravity works against you, you should be putting in more effort and power should go up. As you're cresting, you should be building speed really smoothly. And then on the downhills, you should absolutely be continuing to build speed, but that's the place that you're not chasing power. And so if somebody was looking to average give or take 200 watts over the course of a race, they wouldn't be distributing 200 watts on the hills, over the crests, and on the downhills. You would see high variability. It would be higher, a little bit higher, as you're going up a grade. It will be considerably higher just for a short snapshot as you go over the crest, and it will probably under that average as you've built speed and chasing. And there's a lot of physics behind that, but it's a feeling. It's a flow. But I tell you, the only way that you can really do this is through experience, actually going out and playing, and coaching. That's how you're gonna improve this. You're never gonna get it out of the metrics. And that's why we have so much success when a person comes to a training camp with us, because we can help them understand why, then we can do some one-to-one -one coaching in an applied setting so that they can actually, and this word's important, feel it. Another element that you can do from anywhere in the world is train with a platform that actually simulates that. And if you combine it with some real feedback and coaching, whew, it becomes powerful. Now that's what we do at Purple Patch. And I'll just tell you the truth here, and I don't own any stock uh, in this, I don't get any referral or anything like that, but it is the platform that we use at Purple Patch that is accessible outside of Purple Patch Coaching, and that's Velocity. That is the only program on the market that actually simulates genuine real world conditions around this terrain management. And I tell you something, when you feel it on that platform, and if you amplify that with real coaching with people that you understand, two way video, how we do it at Purple Patch, it's, oh, this is it. Because this is, and, and I can't, overemphasize this to you. I, I am absolutely telling you the truth. What I'm talking about with terrain management on the bike, if you're a triathlete, by a country mile, this is your biggest opportunity. I hate the phrase game changer. This is a game changer. It is a direct speed gainer. It doesn't matter how strong you are, what your FTP is, how resilient you are, how many miles you've done. If you're not working, on mastering terrain management, you're never gonna optimize your speed potential. So you can do this. You can do it with some real in-person coaching and going out and playing and feeling the terrain change. You can do it leveraging 
a platform that at least gets you 90% of the way there on the concepts and then going outside and making it real. This is incredibly important. And so terrain management, key number one. The second building block, no matter what your fitness, is to ride the environment. So we've talked about terrain, hills, crest of hills, going downhill, all really important. The second element that happens in almost any race is the environment. So let's talk about this. If you are riding and you have a headwind, in other words, you're riding into the wind, it's more difficult. You tend to go a little bit slower. And so what should you do as a rider to help you get through that section of road as well as you can to give biggest speed return? Well, there's a couple of components that are really important here. And these are really simple to remember, but they're really important for you. The first is if you are measuring your power, when you've got a wind against you, a headwind, your power should be higher. It's very similar in concept to if you're going up a grade. Okay, you've got something, a force pushing against you, and it's actually physiologically a little bit easier to generate power. So if we're using our 200 watt average, I would expect to see with a headwind, depending on how strong it is, 210, 215, 220, 225, even 230. So you're getting up there at 10 or 15%, even up to 20% more output to actually apply a force against the thing that's going against you. And that is a good investment in effort, okay? Because it's going to actually give you incrementally a bigger speed return when you've got a force against you. Imagine you're going 17 miles an hour. If you put in that extra effort and you go 19 miles an hour, that's an extra two miles an hour. So that's important to you. The second component is I actually lean counterintuitively into riding a slightly bigger gear. And so rather than spinning on the bike, whew, this is hard, spinning, 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 you actually want to put it into a pretty big gear and utilize what we call strength endurance on the lower end of range of your cadence. Now this isn't a huge delta, but you might, if you naturally sit at 80 or 85 revolutions per minute, depending on the strength of the wind, you might be at 70, 75, 78 RPM. So a bit more tension on the chain that's allowing constant tension, really, really important. The third component is you wanna make yourself slippery. So whether you're in a time trial position or road position, you wanna try and reduce your cross-sectional area so that you can reduce drag. Because wind are forced against you, it really slows. So you don't wanna be sitting up there, and you don't wanna have your head high looking through the middle of your eyeball. You wanna get sneaky, quiet, and small while staying supple so that you can reduce drag. That's gonna give you, relative to whatever power you can get out, the best speed return. How about you've got another section of road and you have a tailwind? Well. Physics portrays that the faster we go, so we're getting faster and faster and faster, for every little half a mile an hour of speed gain, we need to incrementally add exponentially more power, more and more power to get incremental speed gains, alrighty? So what that tells us is that chasing power is not smart when you've got a tailwind. Instead, just enjoy the ride. So don't chase your average power. If you're riding along and the environment is quiet and you look down and you see really low power, you've probably got a tailwind. And so in that case, you can add a little bit of a gear, so add a bit more tension, drift your cadence a little bit higher and just maintain easy tension on the chain. And if you're going fast without that much input, well, lucky you because it ain't about who generates the most power, it's who goes fastest. And so that's an opportunity to actually remember to manage your resources, keep the calories going in, but keep the bike flowing. Really important stuff. And that is how, no matter how fit you are and prepared you are, that's how you can think about getting free speed on the bike. At Purple Patch, we talk about terrain management, how to actually navigate variable terrain and the environment to get the biggest speed return possible. 
With Purple Patch's live and on-demand coaching platform, we work on this every single week. It's integrated into your training. And we, including me, coaches you through it. You will improve. These are concepts that can only become habit when you work on it, when you're given feedback, and when you do it right. And this is why we've invested so much time, energy, and money into our video coaching platform. No matter what training level you get to, whatever your fitness is, this training maximizes your speed. You're gonna get more out of any fitness that you have. This is the special source. And it is integrated into all of our program, if a one-to-one coach, into all of our squad programs, and of course, for athletes that are self-coached or coach elsewhere, you can just leverage our standalone bike program. Head to the website and check it out. There are three steps to making you faster. Number one, info at purplepatchfitness.com. Reach out to us. We can set up a complimentary consultation and get you on the right program that serves your needs. And as ever, we stand behind all of our coaching. There is a 30-day money-back guarantee. So what's the risk? Why not just get faster? Back to the show. Part three, the run. The part of the race in which prior mistakes in pacing, fueling, hydration are all revealed. And they are revealed via, quite often, performance decline if you've done it wrong. But let's assume that you're good to go. How do you optimize speed return on the run discipline? Well, the first is often counterintuitive because it's all about walking. For too long, walking in triathlon was reserved as an act of desperation, almost failure. People only taking walk breaks when they were forced to. But I encourage you to shift your lens because this can become a tool in your arsenal to help you go faster. Let's break it down a little bit. The biggest limiter for most athletes is mechanical and muscular fatigue. And you might have experienced this. Your heart and lungs are willing, they're good to go, but the legs just won't follow orders. It's a horrible feeling. But you can actually get ahead of this by adding short walk breaks right from the early stages of your race. And these breaks can actually serve as a nice mental reset and a physical reset. And there are a chance for you every time to restart, kick off really good form once again. And what that means is the running that you do do is executed and done with really good form the best form that you can do, and of course, optimal speed return out of that form. Now, this tactical approach takes a really pragmatic lens and a little bit of bravery. But when you execute it right, it tends to lead to much faster and controlled running off the bike. We educate, guide, coach all purple patch athletes to do this. I recently had an athlete who ran two hours and 36 minutes at the New York Marathon amateur by integrating six walk breaks into that race. Think about that, just over two and a half hours, and he was walking. He looked pretty different compared to the rest of the elite amateurs. But I think this is our big part of our success across the broader scope of our athletes. How we've managed to actually get so many personal breakthroughs and qualifications to world championship events by taking the running, which is often when fatigue shows up, and where performance declines, and taking a really pragmatic lens. Because for most amateur athletes, you don't have to run fast to have a magical running performance. You just have to run well consistently over the duration of your race. And so walk breaks, shift your lens. It's not about desperation. It's not about saving them until you have to. It's about purposeful integration right from the start of the discipline, so that in the latter stages, you're still running, and you're still running relative to your fitness as fast as you possibly can. And that's how, boom, you get the best optimal breakthrough possible. The second element in running, terrain management, really, really valuable. And this is the next layer to this, the smart management of terrain. And of course, we discuss this in the bike extensively, but it still occurs over the course of the running leg as well. The difference in running is you have less gears. And so let's break through and break apart how to deploy smart terrain management on the run. So 
because you don't have gears, this is about system management and speed return. That's what we're talking about. And an element of this actually links into the walk brakes that we're talked about. How do you distribute walk brakes over the course of a run? So we're going to get into that, but let's first talk about terrain. So the first, flat running, you run at your pace, your effort that actually is right for the course that you're doing. So that's very simple. What about when the road pitches up and you're going against a grade, against a hill? Well, that's where you want to build in your effort so you never just run hard. You build in your effort, your effort and heart rate will go up, but you want to be very, very managed in that. And so consistency with good form is better as you're going up hills. And the steeper it gets, the more likely is that you're going to start to integrate walking or more walking. I'll come back to that in a second. When you go downhill, that's the element that you should be chasing speed. But that doesn't mean you're running hard. All you're doing is standing tall, leaning forward a little bit, and allowing gravity to become your friend. And so where you should be carrying speed is on the downhill. Running uphill, you're moderating your effort, but we should expect effort, heart rate to go up a little bit. So that's a simple distribution of work over the course of terrain. But the really important component is where you combine the two. So when you are going uphill, the speed penalty of walking is minimal. And as the grade gets steeper, it's more and more minimal, if you want to make sense. That's sort of a, a very poor English there. But the speed penalty of you taking a walk break is almost nothing. And so if you are going to integrate walk breaks and you're on a variable terrain course, going uphill, that's the time that you want to integrate it. And simply put on the reverse of this is when you're going downhill, even if it's a shallow ground downhill grade, taking a walk break when you're running downhill, the speed penalty is huge. And so simply put, never walk when you're going downhill. Run the downhills, distribute work and manage on the flats with walk breaks that are incrementally sensible. And if necessary, if you're coming up to a hill, save the walk break, keep running, and then integrate a walk break when you're going against the grade. Because that's how you're starting to be smart of layering strategies of walk breaks over the course of variable terrain. That's why I never ask an athlete to run for 10 minutes and walk for one or run for six minutes and walk for 15 seconds. It doesn't make sense to do that. You can use it as a loose framework, but you always need to make sure that you're walking at moments where you can do something useful, that's an aid station, or your actual speed penalty is minimal and that's going uphill. Very simply put, and I hope that helps. That's a really important component. So the only question I have for you is are you brave enough to do that on your run? And that's it folks, your swim, bike and run. There is more to optimize your race results and leverage free speed, but that is gonna be packed into part two of this show. We're gonna dig into energy management, your mindset, as well as some more race craft. But before I leave you, I thought what we would do is reflect and summarize. And so Barry, here are our key sum up and takeaways here. Number one, success requires a shift in your mindset. The old school way of just getting best speed return relative to how it used to be done, that's not enough anymore. To race your fastest, you simply cannot rely on a spreadsheet and the data isn't gonna tell you that. And you can't assume that just getting fitter is gonna drive your optimal speed. This is the next level. This is the amplifier, the extra source that we're talking about. In the swim, we broke it down. Number one, learn how to sight. Number two, apply it in an open water environment and ensure that your technique is prime for an open water environment. And number three, stay focused. And we discuss tools on how to ensure that you don't get lazy or distracted and drift away, but instead stay mission focused with leveraging stroke count. On the bike, I want you fit. I want you really fit. And I also love data-driven progression and readiness. And and I want your best speed. 
So in the bike session, it was all about getting your fitness to work for you to deliver speed. So we talked about having eyes up the road. You want to be engaged to push the effort up the hills a little bit. Not absurdly hard, but definitely an investment of work. Building speed over the crest. And so at Purple Patch, we have a very simple rule. When the grade dissipates and then the speed increases. And then go with the flow and carry speed downhill. In other words, we're avoiding power changes. This naturally produces variance of cadence, variance of power, variance of heart rate. And that's a good thing. The body loves that. But most importantly, the clock at the end of the race really loves it. And then we went into the run. Remember we talked about shift the mindset on walk breaks. They are tools for speed. They're not signs of weakness or desperation. We talked about an athlete that I had running two hours and 36 minutes in the New York Marathon with six to eight walk breaks integrated into that performance. We also talked about the need to never walk downhill, a simple rule to abide by and also choose to walk before your form declines, whether you're on the flats or whether you're on the hills when the speed penalty is low. And so that is how you crack it. I hope that helps. If you have any questions at all about what we discussed on the show, or if you need any support, if you're interested in getting involved in some of the Purple Patch programming, you know the email address, info at purplepatchfitness.com. We're going to provide some insight into some of the education and coaching that we provide at Purple Patch. We would love to get you involved. All right, see you next time. Have a great week. Guys, thanks so much for joining and thank you for listening. I hope that you enjoyed the new format. You can never miss an episode by simply subscribing. Head to the Purple Patch channel of YouTube and you will find it there and you could subscribe. Of course, I'd like to ask you if you will subscribe. Also, share it with your friends. And it's really helpful if you leave a nice positive review in the comments. Now, any questions that you have, let me know. Feel free to add a comment and I will try my best to respond and support you on your performance journey. And in fact, as we commence this video podcast experience, if you have any feedback at all, as mentioned earlier in the show, we would love your help in helping us to improve. Simply email us at info at purplepatchfitness.com or leave it in the comments of the show at the Purple Patch page and we will get you dialed in. We'd love constructive feedback. We are in a growth mindset, as we like to call it. And so feel free to share with your friends. But as I said, let's build this together. Let's make it something special. It's really fun. We're really trying hard to make it a special experience. And we want to welcome you into the Purple Patch community. With that, I hope you have a great week. Stay healthy. Have fun. Keep smiling, doing whatever you do. Take care.